Well, welcome to this special Word in Your Ear, which was recorded uh, in front of an audience at the Word in the Park on June the 3rd in Holden Park in London, which was celebrating the 60th anniversary of the release of the first Rolling Stones single, Come On, in 1963. And the amazing thing, of course, is 60 years later, they're still going, still recording, still talking about touring, and still amazingly fathering grandchildren. And we thought the best person to talk about this would be Leslie Ann Jones, whose new book, The Stone Age, 60 Years of the Rolling Stones, particularly looks at the Rolling Stones through the viewpoint of the many women who've interacted with them, either happily or not, over those 60 years. So over to the arena and Leslie Ann Jones. You're listening to a podcast from The Word. Please welcome Leslie Ann Jones. Absolutely. <laughs> Very good work. You did it. You did it. Are you there? I'm here. Hello, everyone. Hello. Are you alive? Yeah, they are. they're good. Lovely to see you. And that was pretty much part of the idea of the book, wasn't it? To be able to sort of uh, understand a bit more about them via the relationships they have with other people, and particularly the, the, the women they went out with. When I was asked to, is, is this going to work that way? Just in, that's can yeah, yeah, can that's you better. hear me now? Uh, when I was asked to write this book, my first thought was no, because I've read 5,000 books about the Rolling Stones, and what else is there to say? Um, <laughs> On second thoughts, there was another story to tell, which was the story of the Greek chorus of their lives. Uh, the story of everybody else who was involved with them, who was in love with them, who was discarded by them, ruined by them, who had to make sense of life after the relationships with these people. And that sort of set it alight for me. I thought, oh, okay, there, there's, there's a set of encyclopedias here I could write. But condensing it all into a book is, as you both know, the challenge. So let's start with the, the person who allegedly started the group, Brian Jones. Mm -hmm. Fair to say a complicated love life from early on. I think the key to understanding Brian, this was very interesting because... My three young adult children, when I first started talking to them about the Stones, uh, they hadn't even heard of Brian Jones. Brian Jones seems to be the lost founder, as you say, you say allegedly, but he was the founder of the band. Um, he lived in Cheltenham. The key to understanding him, and this is not very often talked about, was that he had um, an elder sister called Pamela who died when she was three. And this was never explained to him. His parents never spoke about it. They brushed it under the carpet. He ended up in the same cemetery as her, by the way, but nowhere near. She got a nice spot in Cheltenham Cemetery. He got the crossroads. And we know the connotations of crossroads in rock and roll. Uh, but he lost his, his sister. He, he thought it was his fault. He developed asthma, and very often bereaved children do develop asthma or other childhood illnesses because of of such trauma, and in the 1940s there was no counselling, no bereavement counselling for children. It was, it was the war years, you know, there wasn't anything of anything at that time. And so he developed an obsession um, with his dead sister. The parents delivered another child called Barbara, his younger sister, who's the absolute spit of him. It was like looking in the mirror. And so his obsession with self to compensate for the lost sister grew and developed. And when he became old enough to have relationships with girls, every girl he chose to go out with... He looked, modelled on himself. Didn't absolutely. They? They look the same on hairs, himself, exactly. on Pamela and on yeah. Barbara. And this is a phenomenon that is known in psychology now, which is when uh, somebody loses somebody very close to them, uh, especially a sibling, a lost sibling, 
there is a subconscious drive to uh, produce children of one's own. And Brian was prolific at this. So he had, as far as we know, five official children by different women, all of whom he abandoned. Nearly all by women that he, who's, into whose houses, parental homes he'd moved in and got them pregnant was then booted out. Got his feet yeah. under the table, yeah. got the girls pregnant, dumped them and moved yeah. on. And this obsession sort of pushed on. He, he moved to London. Every girlfriend, of which there is a record, looks almost identical to him. It's like he was dating his lost sister all the way through. This was absolutely fascinating for me. Right. So, OK, that's Brian. Let's talk about Mick. Mick Jagger, where do you want to start? Well, he doesn't come out of your book terribly well. Actually. He's a very interesting character. His, the key to Mick is his mother, who is an Avon lady. And Mick was experimenting with makeup very early on and making himself look like a woman or a, or a young girl. And the kind of women he was subconsciously seeking were women who looked like him. When he married Bianca, Jerry Hall turned around and said, actually, he's just married himself. Yeah. Um, and, and that is a key, if you, if you examine the two faces side by side. But also there is um, a latent homosexuality about Mick, which would be the key to the drive towards having had affairs with more than 4,000 women. And Mick's problem was always that he... The, it was about the chase. So the minute he got the woman, even before the relationship was established, he was already bored. So he's just going through the motions by this time and looking around to see who's next. So he could not commit. And quite a few of his liaisons were with men. Um, these have always been covered up over the years. But we know, for example, about his affair with Jan Wenner the uh, editor and publisher of Rolling Stone. Um, we know about David Bowie. Uh, quite a lot of people have talked about that. So Ava Cherry, the backing vocalist with uh, David Bowie for many years, she talked openly about uh, the number of phone calls she would get over the years uh, to come and join in a threesome. She said, but it was never really a threesome. It was those two. <laughs> um, so Mick was experimenting on a level that has become um, the norm for lots of people these days none of this stuff is covered up anymore but in those days it was and this is why it was considered shocking he posed as a, a virile sex symbol but we could recast him today as um, a great transgender figure. It would fit very well with the modern narrative. I suppose he would resist it, but he hasn't sued me. But the, so is it fair to say there was a, a lot of competition, sexual competition between them, between, the members of the Rolling Stones? I I think, uh, yes, there was at one point. So we know, for example, Marianne Faithful had affairs with Brian, Mick, and Keith. We know that Anita had affairs with Brian, Mick, and Keith. We know that Mick had... Was it, I'm going to interrupt you. Was it in that order? Uh, was yes. there a kind of hierarchical... <laughs> I, I think Marianne Faithful actually, at one point, I think she's quoted as saying, I slept with so-and-so, I slept with so-and-so, and then I slept with the singer, and the singer was best. It was like a fan. Mick was kind of the stepping stone, really. So they'd start with Brian. Mick would have to get one in because, right. you know, yeah. he couldn't stand to think that anybody else had couldn't got something he hadn't. Yeah. Uh, but then they would end up with Keith because Keith was the prize. Unbelievably, the, uh, the tyke from Dartford was the prize. I can never believe somehow that Anita Pallenberg had abandoned Brian for Keith and that the group managed to keep going. Well, he beat her up, you see. He beat her up. He was very violent. This was another aspect. No, 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 of, I understand that. Yeah. But what I mean is, is that she abandoned him and then, and then got together with Keith and the group, group kept going. You know, the group kept the, going, the, I somehow think. Somehow, for, for 18 yeah. months, they were still there, despite the fact that she had switched camp, as it were. I, I mean, the, well, the tensions must have been ridiculous. I think they weren't, because I think they were out of it most of the time in those days, and they probably didn't really notice. Yeah. Does, let's talk a bit, a bit about it. Do we talk about Charlie and Bill as a, as a duo? Is that, is that yeah, the, the obvious... rhythm section, weren't they? Because um, well, you mentioned both of them had midlife crises. They did. So Charlie's was very unexpected, wasn't it? Charlie well, was, most of yeah, Charlie was, I called him a prefab sprout. He came from a prefab. And his dad was a lorry driver. 
with a tailor. His father had a tailor in the East End. So this doesn't surprise us that Charlie was so obsessed with uh, things sartorial, his image, um, collecting suits, ties, handmade shoes. He had a vast collection of tie pins. So he was the great Gatsby of the band. And he was the good boy. He found his soulmate very early on. He married Shirley when he was 24. They had their one daughter, Serafina. And while the others were out tearing the world to pieces, he was in his hotel room sketching it. He sketched every single hotel room he ever stayed in. Brian Bennett does that as well, by the way. He's got a collection of all his, his hotel rooms as well. But then he got to the 80s and he thought, well, I've never tried any of this stuff that this lot have all wrecked themselves on, and I don't want to get too old and but never have tried it. you he would have looked it. at the others and thought, maybe, maybe I shouldn't try it, because the evidence isn't that great that it works. I suppose it's, it's a bit like if you've never been in the sun and then you get to a stage in your life and you think, ah, I may as well get a suntan now, because if it takes 40 years to cook a cancer of the skin, I'm going to be dead before it kills me. So I think there was that sort of logic yeah. applied. Not very good logic, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, he, he tried heroin, and of course heroin is a highly addictive drug, and he became hooked very quickly, and he nearly lost everything. Nearly lost his wife, his daughter, his house, his money, everything, realized just in time. But I don't know if you know that um, Shirley at the same time became an alcoholic, so the combination of the two of them was really quite destructive. That would have been the great tragedy of the Stones, I think. Mm. Do, you, do you think there's a, you know, you, you, you spent time talking to rock bands, you know, and groups who've been going like 60 years like the Rolling Stones. Their life is divided into two halves. One is mad excitement, and the other is quite boring domestic life. And, the, and do they have a difficulty achieving any kind of balance between those two things? I think Mick Jagger's domestic life was anything but boring. Oh, because, right. I mean, for example, when Jerry had Georgia May, uh, he was having an affair with Carla Bruni the very next day, the future first lady of France. And uh, so Jerry retaliated. She went off and had an affair with Robert Sangster, the, the horse trainer. Um, and then there Which was... Point, Mick retaliated. But he, he, he was retaliating from day one. <laughs> yeah. But uh, then when she had James, he had already impregnated Luciana Murad. And it was when Jerry found out about that child that she kicked him out. That was the end. Because uh, there are only so many loved children that one's husband is allowed to have, right? So there are no quiet weekends, Shay Jagger. I don't that's... think so, no. The, the, the thing is, touring is boring, we know that. Touring, just being on the road is a, is a boring existence. It's not boring at that level with that kind of money and that many slaves running around after you. They, you've, you've been backstage with them. They construct these sort of towns backstage. They each have their... their dressing room, their suite, their own bathroom. It's, it's like a sort of, they take their homes on the road with them. They bring rugs and curtains and pieces of furniture and they have all their special foods and so on. And I think it's a way of checking out of normal life. And, and quite often, they, once they get home, they're off the road for two years. Oh, this isn't much fun. Let's go on the road again. You know, that becomes the addiction getting back out there. And do I think they'll go out one more time? Yes, I do. Mick and Keith are both 80 this year. Ronnie turns 75. Are they really the Rolling Stones? That's the question That's you'd have to ask. Two we still think of Ronnie as the new boy, don't we? We do. I mean, he, he joined in 75. Absolutely. Yeah. Harry the new boy. And you know the reason On why he, money, you know. he joined. So they had Mick Taylor, probably the best guitarist they ever had. Um, when they were down at Nelkut in the south of France, Mick Jagger seduced Mick Taylor under the nose of his new wife, under the nose of the six-week-old baby, and Mick Taylor went mad. He couldn't believe he'd done it and um, hit the drugs, and after a while he collapsed and couldn't continue, and that's why Ronnie Wood is a Rolling Stone. But you think they'll go out one more time? Will they call it one more time? They call, they they've been, they had, I, this is kind of not really appropriate to say anymore, but we used to say the Rolling Stones had had more comebacks than Tina Turner, didn't we? Um, I think there'll be a comeback. Yes, I do. But when Mick or Keith goes, that's the end of the Rolling Stones. Really, technically, they, they can't be the Rolling Stones because... Um, there's only two of them left, but we'd say the same about The Who. It's only Pete and Roger now, isn't it? 
Yeah, yeah, no, sure, sure. So, um, what of, the, of all the stories of all the, of all the particularly of the women that you've uh, you've written about in this book, what is the, what is the one you're you're keenest for people to know about? You think that that, that somebody you didn't get the the prominence that they should have had? I've I've always felt very sorry for Marsha Hunt because Mick tried very hard to have a relationship with her and she resisted. Very intelligent woman, Marsha. And he won her over because this is what Mick Jagger does. He won't take no for an answer. She was sensible. She resisted him. In the end, he said, I'm desperate to have a baby with you. And right up until Karis was born, this was his firstborn, he was very into the idea. The minute Karis arrived, he said, that child's not mine. And Marsha then had to sue him for years and years to get a small amount of money to educate her and bring her up. And I always thought that was pretty shameful. Yeah. So yeah. I think Marsha, you know, Marsha... On a scale sh- of fairly shameful things. That he's yeah. Told. <laughs> she should have had a, a kind of bigger profile, a bigger career, yeah. but she, she devoted herself. She was a devoted mother. Unlike Anita, Anita Pallenberg, who was the worst mother ever on the planet, um, when they were down in, in Nelkut, Marlon was born. Marlon was about three, Keith's eldest, and he was never potty trained. And I have a wonderful picture in my mind of Yoko Ono, who John and Yoko used to go down quite frequently to visit. And naked Marlon is running around, and naked Yoko is running around, <laughs> but she's stepping in the little presents that Marlon is leaving oh, no, all over please. the house. Oh, Lord, no. So it's a luxurious squalor, I suppose. Absolutely. 16-room sort of uh, grand baroque uh, villa, which, which this tyke from Dartford rented, can you imagine? I mean, this, this is the place on earth where Keith Richards does not belong, and he's in his absolute heyday, tearing around Villefranche in uh, his open-top red jag, terrifying all the widows and getting all his mates down. Absolute drug fest, day after day, Clapton, Grand Parsons. You can imagine what that was like. Recording in the basement. And of course, Bianca wouldn't come there. They were renting a a flat in Paris. Bianca was about to give birth anyway. But this was mayhem. Keith was arrested. He was charged with trafficking cannabis and given a suspended sentence and couldn't go back to France for five years. So left and right, they were scuppering their own careers. How are they still going? What I love about the Chateau Nilcott uh, uh, myth is that no matter how much you know about it, you're always discovering more. Yeah, absolutely. Makes it makes it sound even more. The be- my be- my favourite story. Than it actually was. Yeah, no, my favourite story was the in the basement where they recorded and they had the the Stones mobile truck on the driveway outside and all plugged in and it was a sweaty dungeon, just debauchery and and hell. It was Hades. That's what Jimmy Miller said, the producer, when he arrived. This, and he was the one who went around saying, over the air vents all around the basement were gold swastikas, and that this was the HQ of the Gestapo during the war. Well, it's not true. The Germans were never in France for that long. And actually, no Germans lived in that place. But I found out, actually, one did. The housekeeper was German, so how are rumours starts? Right. There's still stuff keeps emerge, uh, emerging. There's well, a lot more like that. Than lots, that. lots more like that, that hair curling stuff in, uh, <laughs> yeah, in the Stone Age, 60 years of the Rolling Stones. Please say thank you to Leslie Ann Jones. Very nice. Thank you. Thanks. This podcast was brought to you by The Word. <laughs> <laughs>